Terry Jandusa Nikolai is here to share how her ex-husband nearly beat her to death and then left her to die in a garbage bin. We're going to speak with Terry in just a moment, but first, let's tell you more about what happened that horrifying morning. It had been three hours since Terry Jandusa Nikolai and her daughters were supposed to return. Nick contacted the police out of concern and gave them David Larson's address. Earlier, a distressed woman called 911 from the same area, but when deputies arrived, the house was found empty. That morning, neighbors saw David towing Terry's car away. Subsequently, another 911 call came and shared vital information. The woman identified herself as Terry, claiming that her ex-husband, David Larson, was attempting to take her life. She was in the back section of his green pickup truck. She did not mention her daughters. Detectives returned to David's home in a hurried attempt to locate Holly or Amanda. Conversely, they discovered an empty firearm case, black sweatpants that matched Nick's description of Terry's clothing that day, and a large bloodstain on the carpet. According to the evidence, Terry had suffered a terrible injury, and David was likely armed. This is the story of Terry Nikolai, who shares her experiences as a survivor of terrible domestic violence. At the time, the psychologist said, well, you know, your mom was hurt pretty bad. Do you know who did this to her? Uh, your dad. On January 31st, 2004, it was a very cold Saturday night for Racine, Wisconsin Sheriff Christopher Schmalley. He ran from his patrol car to the station, the cold air making breathing difficult. Meanwhile, police were investigating a case involving a missing person in a nearby county. Following their investigation, they found a woman inside a garbage can in a storage area. She was surprisingly still alive, despite the extremely cold temperature. This terrifying story highlights how strong people can be, even in the face of challenges. Simultaneously, in a neighboring county, a team of officers was diligently following leads on a missing persons case that Schmeling had been tirelessly investigating. Their pursuit led them to a small locked storage unit. With a sense of grim determination, they broke open the lock and ventured into the dimly lit six by eight foot room. The beams from their flashlights cut through the darkness, revealing two unsettling items, a baseball bat, its surface marred by what appeared to be dried blood, and a garbage can, its lid sealed tight with duct tape. The can was shockingly large, the only object in the room capable of concealing a human body. With hearts pounding and breaths held, they carefully removed the tape and lifted the lid. The sight that met their eyes was horrifying. Inside the can, a woman was curled up, her body contorted into a fetal position. Her eyes were swollen shut and her toes were so blackened by frostbite that they looked as though she was wearing socks. The most shocking revelation, she was still alive. Well, nine years ago, um, in, in January of 2004, I was uh, almost murdered by my ex-husband. Terry Jandusa Nikolai married David Larson in the hopes of living an ordinary, happy life. She had no idea that her spouse had been hiding his actual nature for more than 10 years. Behind his sense of humor and sociability was a dominating and demanding spouse. His temper was quick to ignite over the smallest of issues, such as misaligned window curtains or towels not folded to his exact specifications. He demanded that she leave the door open while showering or using the bathroom his control extending into every aspect of her life. Fearful of his explosive reactions to minor accidents like breaking a glass, she would dispose of any evidence in the neighbor's trash bin. On one occasion, David found a freezer burned sausage link in the trash and berated her for wasting his money. In response, she retorted, why don't you bring it over here and I'll cook it up for you? I talk to women, I tell them, these people don't always come off as being abusive and violent right away. They can be very charming. Uh, they seem like they're very sweet, like they have everything together. And you really need to watch for the signs of control that come out later. Terry Jandusa Nikolai married David Larson in the hopes of living an ordinary, happy life. She had no idea that her spouse had been hiding his actual nature for more than 10 years. Behind his sense of humor and sociability was a dominating and demanding spouse. A few times and said, you do what I say, we're married now. And I will never forget his, his famous quote was, you are bought and paid for. One evening that Terry uh, would never forget began innocently enough with her preparing a simple spaghetti dinner. The ingredients were spread out on the counter and the aroma of the sauce filled the kitchen. But David, her husband, disrupted the peaceful scene. He demanded that she put away the package of noodles, irrationally fearing they would go bad. Terry, exasperated, retorted, do you want to eat dinner or not? They're dry noodles. David's chilling response was that it didn't matter if he made sense or not, she was to obey him. 
The disagreement escalated rapidly and Terry found herself fleeing down the basement stairs. She had no other refuge. David had installed locks on the inside of the doors that only his keys could open. Alone in the basement, she found herself thinking, I'm 30 years old, sitting in a box in my basement, hiding from my husband. What the hell am I doing? This incident served as a wake-up call for Terry. She knew she needed to leave David. My oldest daughter, Amanda, who was two at the time, crawling underneath the table and just putting her hands over her ears and crying and just saying Shit. And I remember I looked at her and I thought, this is, this is not what I want for my kids. They had two young daughters together, and Terry knew it was only a matter of time before he would turn his torture towards them. She took her children and sought refuge at a shelter. At the time, I was in fear for my life, she admits. On the day of their divorce, David sat in the courtroom, tears streaming down his face. You're going to regret this, he warned. On January 31st of 2001, the date of our divorce, when we walked out of the courtroom, he was crying. And I remember looking at him thinking, why is he crying? He hates me, he's so horrible to me. And I remember looking at him and he said, you're gonna regret this. But Terry was undeterred. Fast forward three years and Terry had managed to rebuild her life. She met and married a wonderful man, Nick Nikolai, who showered her and her daughters with love. But Terry was undeterred. Fast forward three years and Terry had managed to rebuild her life. She met and married a wonderful man, Nick Nikolai, who showered her and her daughters with love. They were overjoyed to discover they were expecting a new addition to their family. The aftermath of Terry's divorce from David was a tempest of legal battles, with Terry fighting tooth and nail for full custody of their children. She argued passionately, he's violent towards me. Why should he be alone with our kids? Yet the court was swayed by the seemingly sincere desire of a father to spend time with his children. David's verbal and physical attacks on Terry didn't cease, becoming particularly intense during the handover of their daughters. The situation spiraled to such an extent that Terry insisted on making the exchanges in public places like McDonald's or the hardware store, seeking the safety of crowded spaces. She reached out to the police twice, and after enduring this torment, she eventually secured a restraining order against him. Despite the order explicitly prohibiting David from owning weapons, Terry was painfully aware that he still kept firearms in the house. But without a search warrant to confirm their presence, the police were powerless to enforce this part of the order. Terry's daughter stood by her side on the day she married Nick Nikolai, serving as a symbol of new beginnings and hope in the midst of her turbulent past. Yet, Terry clung to the belief that her ex-husband had moved past his resentment. Even with the restraining order in place, when David requested Terry to pick up their daughters from his house, she complied. She reasoned that she couldn't always ask her husband or friends to accompany her. David was still residing in their former marital home, which was now in a state of disarray, bordering on hoarding. He had retained keepsakes from their wedding, including her dress, photo albums, and video footage. He showed these to to their daughters as twisted evidence that mommy doesn't keep her promises. This was a chilling reminder of the control he still sought to exert over Terry and their daughters. A parent having the rights to be with, with the children right. and you know just because you're a parent doesn't give you an automatic right to be with your children. You need to be a healthy, functional parent. Right. There's and responsibility. Responsibility, exactly. Absolutely. On a day that would forever alter the course of her life, Terry found herself standing at David's doorstep. It was exactly three years to the day since their divorce, a fact that hung heavy in the air. David, unusually calm, told her that their daughters, just six and four years old, were playing hide and seek and eagerly awaiting their mom to find them. Despite every instinct screaming at her not to enter, she didn't want to disappoint her kids, so she stepped inside the house. Hours ticked by, and when Terry and the girls were long overdue, Nick, her current husband, called the police. As he relayed David Larson's address to the dispatchers, they recognized it. A woman, panting and out of breath, had called 911 earlier from the same location. Deputies were already on the scene, but the house was eerily deserted. Neighbors reported seeing David towing Terry's car away that morning. Then, a second 911 call came in. This time, the woman managed to stay conscious long enough to provide crucial information. She identified herself as Terry Jindusa Nikolai, claimed her ex-husband was trying to take her life, and revealed she was in the back of his green pickup truck. She mentioned nothing about her daughters. Detectives returned to David's home, hoping to find Holly or Amanda. Instead, they discovered black sweatpants matching Nick's description of Terry's outfit that day, a large blood stain on the carpet, and an empty handgun case. The assumption now was that Terry had been severely attacked and David was armed. I'm five foot eight, so I'm in this garbage can and my knees are like totally squished up to the sides and I'm barefoot. And I remember my feet being so freezing and I was just trying to get my hands to cup my feet and I, I couldn't get my hands down there because I couldn't reach. 
So I had to just sit there and there's nothing I could do. Close to 100 law enforcement officers were dispatched following leads in the case. Volunteers who had never even met Terry spent the afternoon driving around unfinished neighborhoods, scouring the basements of incomplete houses for any trace of her. The community was held at bay for 26 hours, Schmeling remembers. As the investigation unfolded, David's facade began to crumble. He started getting emotional as I was calling him on his lies, Schmeling recalls. The truth was closing in and David's composed demeanor was beginning to falter. When an Amber Alert turned up empty, the police decided to wait for David at his workplace, where he served as an air traffic controller. However, when he arrived, there were no signs of Terry or their daughters in his car. Officers approached him, informing him that his ex-wife was missing and requested his assistance at the station. Detectives Chris Schmeling and Thomas Naus found themselves locked in a marathon interrogation session with David that stretched on for an exhausting six and a half hours. David's initial defense was that Terry hadn't shown up to pick up their daughters, leading him to drop the kids off at his girlfriend's house before heading to work. A swift check by the authorities confirmed the children were safe at the said location, but both girls claimed they hadn't seen their mother that day. I was begging him, talking to him with a tremendous amount of respect, Schmeling recalls, the urgency of finding Terry alive, adding a palpable tension to the room. The detectives then dropped a bombshell, they had found Terry's pants and traces of blood in David's house. He started showing emotions as I began challenging his lies, Schmeling recounts. David defended himself, claiming Terry had attacked him and he had merely retaliated in self-defense. He described the rest as blur, but this admission was enough for the authorities to detain him. During the process, detectives seized David's personal belongings, including a wallet filled with business cards and receipts. Among these, they found a card for a storage facility located near a town where David owned property. A quick phone call confirmed David had visited a storage unit there that very morning. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly falling into place, painting a chilling picture of the events that had transpired. In the dimly lit corner of the storage unit, officers made a heart-wrenching discovery. Terry was there. Her core body temperature had dropped to a life-threatening 86 degree Fahrenheit. Doctors would later estimate that she was within an hour of death. The unborn child she had been carrying for weeks was tragically no longer viable. David Larson had inflicted such severe trauma on Terry, including a devastating injury to her skull, that authorities feared moving her from the trash can might cause further harm. So they made the difficult decision to leave her in the garbage receptacle until the paramedics arrived. So there was muffled sound of a woman's voice coming out of a storage unit. What's your name? And I said, I'm Terry from Racine. And uh, I just, I could hear his sigh, like, oh my God, we found her. Schmeling found himself contemplating the location of the storage unit. He realized that David, who worked as an air traffic controller, could see the storage unit from his work window. He knew that Terry was either in excruciating pain or already gone. David was so confident he would get away with his heinous act that he didn't even check if Terry had a phone before discarding her in the trash can. He had brutally attacked her with a baseball bat while their daughters were locked in a room in his house. They were crying because they were hungry, and the movie they were watching had ended. After David left Terry in the storage unit, she found herself thinking about her family. If you have kids or someone you want to live for, that's enough she says. She called out David's name to see if he was still there. When he didn't answer, she started yelling for help. Is it difficult to watch a story like that? It is. Um, in all the talks that I do, I've seen it so many times, yeah. it almost becomes surreal to me. Yeah. On August 16th, 2005, justice was served. David was sentenced to 35 years in jail for attempting to end the life of Terry. Terry spent about seven weeks in the hospital, undergoing 10 surgeries. Even after she went home, she had to use a wheelchair for a few more weeks. She was upset that she couldn't run or go upstairs to put her daughters to bed at night, but she was relieved that she and her girls were safe and wouldn't have to see David again. Now she laughs when she thinks about it. The man who tried to end her life ended up losing his own. Dying was not an option because my girls need me. I don't remember much about the rescue, but I felt great relief when I heard the paramedics. We look forward to expanding our family. I'm grateful to God for my safe return and the safety of my two children, Terry said from Lutheran General Hospital in Park Ridge where she had been recovering since her rescue a week and a half earlier. I'm thankful for everyone's prayers and support. Kim Vadis from NBC5 reported that doctors were amazed that Terry was still alive. She looks so well now that it's hard to believe the state she was in, said Dr. Michael Bayoun. Her head was about three times its normal size. Later on January 31st, after being kidnapped, 
Terry managed to call the police from her cell phone. However, she spent 21 grueling hours trapped in the trash bin before investigators found her. The police reported that her ex-husband had also kidnapped their two children, who were later found unharmed at a babysitter's house. Next week, it was revealed that Terry had suffered a miscarriage during her ordeal. But when she spoke on Wednesday, she focused on her future's positive aspects. She mentioned that it was the four-month anniversary of her marriage to her current husband, Nick Nikolai. Her husband, Nick Nikolai, shared her hope for the future. I know that soon Terry will be running around with the kids again, and we look forward to growing our family one day, he said. Terry has a wonderful spirit, and I know she will recover. We look forward to expanding our family. Terry has a wonderful spirit, and she will recover. Doctors told Terry that the cold might hurt her hands and feet forever. She had another surgery coming up. The skin around her toes was in danger. Terry decided to speak up because she wanted to fight against people hurting their family. More and more people are hurting their family. She said, I want to use my story to make a change. After all this, I know I'm stronger than I thought. The lawyer said Larson kidnapped Terry and their two daughters. He tied up Terry and put her in his truck. As he drove, he stopped many times to hit his ex-wife with a baseball bat. The kids couldn't see much from their car seats, Assistant U.S. Attorney Mario Gonzalez told NBC5. The District Attorney of Racine County told the family that they planned to look at Terry's medical records. Terry's brother, Mike, hoped that the new information about his sister's lost baby could lead to more charges against Larson. NBC5 said that both Wisconsin and Illinois have laws that say ending the life of an unborn baby at any stage of pregnancy is homicide. Um, that's really, that's just horrible to go through and I pray for her friends. After the attack, she spent time recovering in the hospital. Three years later, she was pictured holding her six-month-old son, Benjamin, a symbol of her resilience. A year later, Terry decided to share her story, hoping to educate others about domestic misconduct. On another day, she visited UND. Her talk at the Memorial Union Lecture Bowl was arranged by the University Programming Council, the UND Women's Center, and the UND Counseling Center. Even though she's been speaking for many years, Terry sometimes finds it hard to tell her story, but she draws strength from the people she knows she's helped. Sometimes before I go somewhere, I have to bring up all this again. But when I get there and I see how people react, they need me to do that. And it makes me feel good, Terry said. I might say 10 things or one thing that's gonna change their life. After that, I feel really good. So that's what keeps me going. Terry started the event by showing ABC's 2020 special that aired almost a decade ago. She then talked about her relationship with her ex-husband, David Larson, before they were married. She pointed out key signs and sneaky behaviors that are often missed, like control and isolation, which are common tactics used by offenders. Terry Jendusa Nikolai pointed out that self-esteem is a powerful tool in preventing offenders from gaining control. She suggested a simple exercise that anyone can do. Write down five good things about yourself. Complete the sentence, I am, with everything you know about yourself. This way, you're validating yourself, she advised. By writing it down and seeing the kind of person you are, you're not only making yourself stronger, but also making it harder for someone else to break you down. Even though the audience was mostly women that Monday night, there were a few men scattered throughout. Terry stressed that domestic misconduct isn't just a women's issue, it's a societal issue. They're doing extremely well today. You wouldn't even know that they would have gone through anything like that. Men who attend these talks can become important allies. When I started this in 2005, it was all women. But as time went on, more men started to attend. Sometimes it's even half and half. Men are becoming more involved in this issue, which is crucial, she said. Everyone needs to get involved. If men see their friends treating a woman badly, they should speak up. They play a crucial role. Terry expressed gratitude for the support her family and friends provided during her marriage. She also had advice for those who want to help someone they know who's experiencing domestic violence. Your first instinct is to fix it for them, which is good because they need to know you're there for them. Harry said. But what they really need are resources like a women's center number or an offer to accompany them to a counselor. She acknowledged that it might be hard to know someone is being offended, but forcing help on the victim might not be the best approach. While many people think they don't know anyone experiencing domestic misconduct, Terry believes people should be informed and cared for. You might be surprised to find out that you do know someone going through this, but it's just not talked about openly, she said. Even if you don't, why would we be selfish and say we don't care because it's not happening to us? We need to care about each other and make our community a better place for everyone one.
Imagine hearing Terry's tales of Larson's domineering nature. It's quite a contrast to his current situation. As Sheriff Schmaling points out, he's told when to go to bed, when to get up, what he needs to do for all the days of the rest of his life. Now, Larson has no control over anyone, a stark difference from his past. In the 13 years following the chilling incident, Terry has played a key role in shaping laws that shield victims of domestic violence. One such law is Wisconsin's SAFE Act. This law, enacted in 2014, disarms offenders, ensuring they can't threaten their victims with firearms. David had threatened Terry with the very gun he was supposed to have surrendered under her restraining order against him. This law empowers the sheriff's deputies, allowing them to confiscate an offender's firearms without needing a warrant. Terry's story was featured in 2017 as the opening episode of Oxygen's new true crime series, Three Days to Live. We're going to speak with Terry in just a moment, but first, let's tell you more about what happened that horrifying morning. Which focuses on women's stories. The show's name is derived from a grim statistic. The likelihood of finding an abducted woman alive drops dramatically after the first 72 hours. A few years after her ordeal, Terry and Nick were blessed with a son. Now nine years old, he's a delightful younger sibling to teenagers Holly and Amanda. When asked about the source of her strength on the freezing night she was left to perish, Terry recalls a quote from Nancy Reagan, a woman is like a tea bag. Only in hot water do you realize how strong she is. Um, he says that he loves our children, but I don't see that because anyone who loves their children could never try to kill their mother. On March 21st, 2015, ABC aired a gripping two hours program titled In an Instant. Despite all odds, Terry survived this 26 hours nightmare, largely due to the heroic efforts of Dr. Matthew Jimenez, an orthopedic surgeon who played a key role in her recovery. When you saw Terry, you couldn't recognize her as a human, Dr. Jimenez recalled. Her face was unrecognizable. As a trauma surgeon for 20 years at one of the busiest trauma centers in North America, I've seen it all, and this was one of the worst. Terry had suffered a crushed skull, multiple broken bones, and severe frostbite, and her body temperature had dropped to a life-threatening 74 degrees. At one point, doctors thought she had only an hour left to live. When she came in, her feet were a dark purple color, Dr. Jimenez said, indicating a serious risk of life-threatening infection. Doctors could have amputated her feet midway, which would have healed more quickly and let Terry go home sooner, but it would have made walking much more difficult. So doctors and Terry decided to save as much of the length of the feet as possible. Ultimately, Terry lost all of her toes, which I know sounds terrible and is a significant loss, Dr. Jimenez said. But in her scenario, a great victory because when she first came in, it looked like a lot more of the tissue would be lost. Terry never gave up, said Dr. Jimenez, who has stayed in contact with Terry for the past 11 years and still sees her on a regular basis as a patient. She said, I knew I was going to die. And the only reason I really stuck around was for my kids, he said. She was thinking, what kind of parent would he be? What would he do to those kids? Throughout a months long recovery process, which included facial reconstruction and scalp surgery, Terry had this amazing attitude. She never felt sorry for herself. She never said, why is this happening to me? She would always say, how are my kids? I am so lucky to be alive. She thanked the doctors and nurses. She lived in gratitude. Larson did not completely duct tape over Terry's mouth, which left her room to breathe. Further, she played dead when he was beating her with the bat. She would say to me on rounds, I would just hold my breath and play dead, hoping he would stop hitting me, Dr. Jimenez said. Terry Gendusa Nikolai is here to share how her ex-husband nearly beat her to death and then left her to die in a garbage bin. A decade has passed since Terry Gendusa Nikolai, a woman from Racine County, was kidnapped brutally attacked, and left to perish in a frigid storage locker. Today, she stands as a beacon of hope, advocating against domestic violence. She shared her story of survival with Fox 6 News. I don't know if I can say I've gotten to the point where I can say I've forgiven him, but I've gotten to the point where I can say what I hope for him is that he changes his mind and he changes his heart toward God, Terry expressed. The near-death experience that shook Jendus and Nikolai's world also sparked a realization. She discovered a purpose, to become a voice for victims of domestic violence, advocating for change in the law. I'm just your neighbor. I'm from your neighborhood. I was educated. I went to college. I had a very good family. Yet I fell into this. 
Gendusa Nikolai shared, emphasizing that anyone could find themselves in a similar situation. In 2014, her decade-long journey of survival was recognized on Friday, January 31st. The honor was bestowed by Christopher Schmeling, one of the lead investigators on her case, who now serves as the Racine County Sheriff. During those 10 years, officials in Racine County have collaborated with Gendusa Nikolai. Their collective efforts have been focused on securing more resources for victims of domestic violence, improving the victim notification system to keep them informed about their attacker's whereabouts, and enacting laws to safeguard victims. So, Terry Gendusa Nikolai has not only survived, but thrived, becoming a beacon of hope and a tireless advocate against domestic violence. Her journey of healing and advocacy did not stop with her recovery and the legal resolution of her case against her ex-husband, David Larson. After overcoming the physical and psychological scars of her ordeal, Terry has dedicated herself to helping others who have suffered from domestic violence. She became actively involved in advocating for victims' rights and has worked to ensure that the legal system provides the support and protection that victims of domestic violence desperately need. It's a tricky question when people say, what do you tell women to do? Because you can never meet someone for a few minutes and say this is the direction I think you should go because that can be dangerous. They need to get to like the Women's Resource Center, get an advocate working with them to steer them in the, re the direction that they need to go. You can never just say just leave because sometimes that's the most dangerous time. You need to set up a plan and you need somebody to help you do that. In recent years, Terry has taken her advocacy to a broader platform. In 2023, she ran for the position of Waterford Town Board Chairperson, demonstrating her commitment to community service and leadership. Her candidacy for public office reflects her dedication to making a difference in her community and beyond. Beyond her political ambitions, Terry has also served as the state chair for Marzi's Law for Wisconsin, where she has been a vocal advocate for giving victims more of a voice in the judicial system. Her work with Marzi's Law has been instrumental in pushing for legal reforms that strengthen the rights of victims, ensuring they are treated with the respect and dignity they deserve throughout the legal process. Through public speaking, engagement with legislative bodies, and participation in various campaigns, Terry has used her voice and her story to effect change. Terry Gendusa Nikolai's life after that incident has been marked by her relentless pursuit of justice, her unwavering support for other victims, and her dedication to public service. She stands as a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the power of one person to make a significant impact in the fight against domestic violence. Uh, anything you want to add before we wrap things up here? It's great to see you again. Thank you. It's great to be here with you again, too. Yes, um, you know, I, we are making a lot of progress in changing laws to help people who are suffering with domestic violence, and um, things are getting better. So if somebody is in a situation like that, male or female, there is help out there. Yeah, it's good to see that smile on your face. Thank you. <laughs> Terry Gendusa, Nikolai's story shows us how one person can fight back and make big changes after something very bad happens. She teaches us about bravery and helping others. Don't forget to follow for more stories about people who make a difference.